Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Product School webinar. Thanks for joining us today. Just in case you guys didn't know, Product School teaches product management, coding, data analytics, digital marketing, and blockchain courses online and at our 15 campuses worldwide. On top of that, every week we offer some amazing local product management events and host online webinars like this one, live streams, and Ask Me Anything sessions. Head over to productschool.com after this webinar to check them out. Today, we have an awesome guest presenting. I'd like to introduce you to Mark Yamashita. Mark is a product owner and business manager at Capital One Canada. He began his career as an engineer at IBM working on the, com working on the compiler for IBM mainframes. He earned an MBA from the University of Oxford and from there joined Capital One as a business analyst. During his time as a business analyst, he found his niche at the intersection of technology and business and joined the product management team. Feel free to leave any questions for Mark in the comments and I'll ask him them at the end. And uh, without further ado, let's welcome Mark. Thanks so much for joining us today, Mark. Hey, thanks for that great introduction, Dan. All right. So uh, thanks everyone for taking the time out of your schedule to, uh, to, to hear me out today. Uh, the next 30 minutes, I'd love to talk to you about uh, driving focus within your product, maintaining focus and, and why that's really important uh, for product managers today. And uh, in the second half, uh, what I'd like to do is introduce the concept of objectives and key results as, as a means to, uh, main, uh, to get that focus. So to start off, um, why is, why is focus so important today? Why, why are we striving to, uh, to have that? Well, let me give you an example. Let's pretend that um, you know, you've, uh, you've done your homework. Uh, you've, you understand your customer, you understand the problem, and you've devised this great strategy uh, which centers around this perfect key feature that you think is gonna propel your product forward. Now, let's assume that you're coming up to your, the start of your quarter and I'll, I'll just assume that you, uh, you plan on a quarterly basis, but as you start to creep up to that quarter, let's, let's assume as well that all of these other things start to come out of the woodwork. Uh, someone from your, your enterprise team tells you you need to migrate a service. Uh, your compliance team tells you you need to update something in your product to, to meet a regulation. Let's say your VP goes to a conference and tells you you have to have this new feature or your sales team is asking you to implement a feature to open, you know, to close a sale. Uh, maybe your tech team is asking you for continuous improvements. Your business analyst wants an enhancement to your analytics. Maybe marketing wants you to do something to open up a new market. And uh, maybe your BSA wants you to migrate some data. So all of a sudden you go from having this perfect plan, this, this you know, crisp, clean uh, strategy uh, for the quarter to well, essentially all of these stakeholders asking for all of these different things. And, uh, you know, this can be really daunting uh, for, for new product managers. It can be, new, can be very daunting for experienced product managers. Uh, so what do you do? What, what should you do? Well, what I want to almost convince you of today is that um, focusing on one or maybe a few objectives will be far more productive than trying to multitask many goals. Um, and just quickly, what I'll, what, I, what I'll define as productive is that you're driving the most business or customer value through your product. Um, you know, and that, I think that definition will, will sort of become more important uh, as, I, as I progress. All right, so um, what does that mean? How do we go about that? Well, the first thing um, that I'll say is, is stop multitasking. I know that may seem a little contentious, uh, especially in this day and age, um, but it's really important. And it's, it's really hard to do. I mean, uh, when you think about it, now that everyone has a cell phone in their pocket, um, we're basically constantly busy. You're standing in line for two minutes uh, with nothing to do. You immediately pull out your cell phone and check some emails or read an article. And, uh, you know, we, we're just now programmed to be busy 24 seven. Um, so as Dan mentioned, you know, I started my career off at IBM and, you know, a little example from my experience is that when I was a developer, I would I'd be sitting there and I'd be writing a piece of code and, uh, you know, all of a sudden my email would go off or someone would come by and ask a question. And, uh, you know, I'd go and answer an email or I'd 
answer a question. And then as I came back to the piece of code that I was working on not 10 or 15 minutes ago, I realized I basically forgot what I was doing and I had to relearn it. The fact of the matter is that humans are just not very good at, at multitasking. We're not good at that context switch between you know, topic A and topic B. Uh, and it takes us time to sort of go back and forth. And um, that, that applies as well to, to the product. So that, that micro effect translates right to the macro effect. When, when you as a product manager and uh, you know, your, your product is trying to accomplish multiple things at one time, you get into situations where uh, your developers or you know, your team, whether that be marketing, development, whatever, are trying to juggle multiple different things. It's almost impossible to just sort of say, you work on this one thing. There's always gonna be collaboration and working together. So you know, if your product is trying to do a whole bunch of things at once, then you know, your team is gonna be multitasking. And this is just inherently bad. So what I'm ultimately trying to get at is that busy and productive are not the same thing. And um, you know, by busy, I mean uh, fully utilized, working on something every minute of every day. And productive, I mean driving value. And uh, you know, I think when you're starting off as a product manager, this can be really hard to, to break out of. Um, you know, uh, I'll use agile development uh, as sort of my baseline. And I apologize if you're not familiar with agile development, but um, when you think about how we, we do agile development at a very kind of basic level, you know, you're creating stories and your goal is to create smaller and smaller stories that are more, more granular, uh, you know, loosely coupled, highly cohesive, which, which definitely is a good thing, but you know, it, it kind of creates this scenario where you want to think of product management as basically um, a bin packing algorithm. You know, even the way the tools are designed, like something like Jira, you're just like, trying to slot in as many different things. And you, know, you start to think that you are doing your job really well by interleaving all of these different activities and, and epics to the point where you, know, you are essentially working towards utilizing every member of your team 100% of the time. And um, the argument that I'm trying to make today is that that's not necessarily a good thing. Actually, it's probably not a good thing um, by by sort of letting off the gas and being really, um, being really definitive about what you what work you take on and what work you don't take on, I think you can drive more value to your product. So, let's switch gears a little now. Um, hopefully, that you know you're on board with my argument here, and you know you you agree at least in some sense that um, focusing on the right things is really important. Let's talk about OKRs or objectives and key results as a way to drive that focus. Now, OKRs are, uh, they're not a new concept. They've actually been around since the 70s. A guy named Andy Grove uh, developed them while he was running Intel. And uh, they really got a lot of prominence back in the 90s when Google started to, uh, to use them for their planning. Now, there's a lot of definitions around what an OKR, what are OKRs, but Quite simply, I think of it as a way to get everyone focusing on what matters. It's, it's a framework to help your team or your product align to just a few goals. Now, for those of us who are, are in a, an agile development space, um, I found this really useful in kind of understanding how OKRs fit into the grand scheme of things. So, let's assume that your product has a vision. Let's, actually, let's hope that your product has a vision. You know, something, a world that you wanna make possible through your efforts. From there, you can derive a mission. Um, what is the reason for your product? Now, what a lot of teams will do at this point is they'll, they'll take their mission, they'll put it up on the wall, and then they'll jump into, okay, what are we gonna build? What features do we wanna do? And then from there, they'll break them down into epics. And from there, they'll break them down into stories and so on and so forth and start working. And very rarely do they try to true back up because what we're working on really helping us achieve our mission. And that's where OKRs are really powerful. Um, they, they provide this bridge over that big chasm of intent. 
you know, from your mission, it's actually quite easy to think, okay, are these objectives helping me achieve my mission? And then key results directly feed into objectives. And then that step from key results to features is a lot smaller. It's very easy to ask, okay, is this feature that I'm working on helping me achieve my key results? All right, so enough, uh, enough preamble, what are uh, objectives? So objectives are qualitative goals. And they're not just any goals, they are move the needle goals for the product. They should be inspirational and attainable. Uh, I really like these two words. They're, they're out of a book by uh, Ben Lamort, Lamort and Paul Niven uh, on, on OKRs. And if you get the chance, uh, it's a great read. You should also have no more than three and less is better. Given this is a, a talk on focus, I hope that should be fairly straightforward. <clears throat> and they should be easy to communicate and answer the question why. And key results, on the other hand, are quantitative. They measure your progress towards an objective and they should be aspirational and attainable. Again, from the uh, Lamore Nevin book. You should have no more than three per objective and they should be simple to understand. Uh, you shouldn't need a, a business analyst to, to describe what you're trying to uh, achieve. Okay, so that's a, a brief summary about what are OKRs. Um, but as with uh, most frameworks that are simple, uh, they're deceptively simple in that the devil is on the details. So to, uh, you know, to give you an advantage and hopefully add a little kind of tactical juice to this presentation, I thought I would walk you through a couple of examples to show you some common pitfalls and what you want to look for when you're building your OKRs. Now, a couple of things to remember. First, when you're sitting down to write your OKRs, involve your team. Uh, the worst thing you can do is come up with these perfect objectives and key results and then just hand them down to your team. There's, there's no buy-in, there's no involvement to that in that way. What you wanna do is, is get your team in the room, uh, argue, um, compromise, disagree, and ultimately when you come out, have everyone committing to what they've decided as a team. Also, leave yourself enough time. Uh, OKRs aren't something that you go and have a one hour meeting and bang out. You wanna leave yourself a week or two to meet, go away, think about it, digest and come back. Now there's a lot of, um, a lot of literature on sort of organizational OKRs. Uh, all I'll really say on that is that if your line of business, your organization have OKRs, you should really think about how do your objectives contribute up to those. And finally, be ambitious. Uh, OKRs are not about maintaining what you're already doing. Uh, as I said, inspirational but attainable are great guidelines for where you should be shooting towards. There's a lot of, there's a lot of back and forth on how successful you should be in your OKRs for numbers like 50% or 75%. <clears throat> Suffice it to say that you know, if you're not hitting any of your OKRs, you're probably being too hard on yourself. But if you're hitting all of your OKRs, you're probably not being ambitious enough. So to, uh, to help illustrate and give everyone uh, hopefully a chance to understand kind of the, uh, the context, I've picked a couple of companies that are what I think stalwarts of business that I'm hoping everyone should be familiar with. And the first one is, uh, is Duff Beer. So those of you familiar with The Simpsons, um, I would guess that the mission of Duff Beer is to provide a reasonably priced beer for the average consumer to enjoy. Now let's imagine that we've, we've sat down and we brainstormed a bunch of objectives. So the first one we came up with was maintain current sales volumes in our established market. <clears throat> Honestly, this one's not very inspirational. Again, you know, you should be trying to move the needle and I don't think maintaining current sales volumes has really moved the needle. Uh, next one is the other side of the coin. <clears throat> Convince most wine drinkers to switch to Duff beer. Well, um, if you shoot too high, basically your team's gonna walk out, walk out of your meeting saying, we're never gonna hit that, and just start thinking about excuses uh, as to why they're not gonna hit it at the end of the quarter. <clears throat> uh, number three, redesign our logo and packaging. Uh, the question immediately comes up when you have an objective like that is, why? What, what value are you driving? Always try to answer that question of why. And finally, 
Objective four, successfully launch a light version of our flagship beer to increase sales. So I think this one's, you know, right on the money. It's inspirational, it's attainable, it's qualitative. <clears throat> so the second company that I picked was Cyberdyne Systems. For those of you familiar with the Terminator series, um, this is the company that built the Terminator. So a fitting mission might be to provide military defense systems free from the shortcomings of human operators. So let's assume that uh, we've come up with these objectives again. And the first one is implement a recursive neural network algorithm to assess and classify threats. Whatever that means, um, that might be a great objective, but it's too hard to communicate. It's too much jargon. Make it readable. This should be something that any, any one of your executives can understand. Second objective, reduce production costs of T800 to improve profitability. Great, very clear objective. It's inspirational, it's attainable, it's qualitative. Finally, write a history of robotics for public distribution. So something I see a lot too. Uh, you have an objective up there and the first question that comes to mind is, what's the value you're generating? So always kind of think about that when you're trying to write these. Okay, great, so we have a couple examples. We have some objectives. Let's think about key results. So let's go back to the Duff Beer example. <clears throat> and let's maintain our objective that we came up with that we liked. So a light version of our flagship beer. First key result is design the can and bottle for Duff Light. Well, one, it's not quantitative. Um, it's not really a key result. It's probably a task under something else. So, you know, always think about where that kind of scope lies. Uh, number two is Duff Light is available at 50 restaurants or bars in Springfield. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna say that this is aspirational, attainable and quantitative. It's definitely quantitative and I don't know how many restaurants or bars are in Springfield, but let's just assume that it's aspirational and attainable. Uh, the next one is something I see quite often. Create a good marketing campaign for Duff Light. Great. What does good mean? Especially with something like marketing, uh, there are so many metrics out there. There's share of voice, uh, impressions, cost to acquire, all of these great metrics. Pick the one that's most relevant for you and then measure it and start using that as your key result to drive. And then the last one is 25% of all Duff merchandise is branded with Duff Light. So I initially said, okay, this, this is tangential. This doesn't measure progress towards our objective. <clears throat> but one of my colleagues came back and said, well, what if, what if it is? So there's a little bit of gray area here in that, well, is merchandising uh, part of that successful launch? <clears throat> and that's for you to decide. Hey, Mark, really sorry to interrupt you here quick, but um, I don't think your slides are being shared. Did you have any slides for this? Ah. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, I've been going through them. Um, Sorry, let me pull this up. Oh, I'm really sorry about that. I would have said something earlier, but I thought at first you didn't have any slides. Oh, no. Um, sorry, let me just... Video... Oh. Damn. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, don't worry. I'll, uh, to anyone who's watching, I'll make sure that I get Mark to uh, send over the slides and I can provide them all for you guys so you can uh, keep up and look at them later. Yeah, sorry there about that. Go. I must have, uh, the presentation was working on my machine, but okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Cool. Sorry. Yeah. If anybody wants the slides afterwards, by all means, reach out and I can definitely provide them. Um, yeah. So, okay. Let's jump back in. Um, so, um, where was I? There we go. Okay. Cyberdyne Systems example. Um, let's assume we have uh, our objective, reduce production costs of T800 to improve profitability, and we come up with these four key results. Um, first key result is <clears throat> reduce secondary actuator defects from half a percent to quarter percent. Well, this is probably not that aspirational, and it doesn't sound very key. Key result number two, uh, reduce production defects requiring rework from 15% to 2%. That sounds like a really good key result. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, most likely uh, key result number one is probably gonna fall in underneath of key result number two. Key result number three is something I see a lot too. Uh, increase customer satisfaction by 25%. So a lot of times, you know, you, you have uh, 
uh, one of your stakeholders is really concerned about customer satisfaction. You know, that's, that's something the company is concerned about. So you feel like you need to tack in, tack in sort of, hey, we, we should be thinking about customer satisfaction. Reduce that urge. Don't, don't try to, you know, add in, a, add in a key result just to cover your base. And finally, key result number four is achieve a total production cost of 50,000 per unit. And again, great. It's aspirational, it's attainable, it's qualitative. So, okay, uh, hopefully you guys followed along without any slides. Again, sorry about that. Um, so the worst thing that uh, you can do is, is go in and write these and uh, you know, not get the most value out of them. So I wanna talk briefly about using your OKRs. Um, if you only look at your OKRs once per quarter, people will only care about them once per quarter. Uh, you know, uh, in my experience, there is a fine line between undersharing and oversharing, and um, I, I definitely, uh, I definitely advise you to overshare uh, in that scenario. For instance, in my team, uh, the the first slide that I start off with in all of my major ceremonies, so demos, uh, sprint planning, sprint review, is my OKR slide. You know, and I asked the question, are we still working on the right thing? And, uh, <clears throat> you know, hopefully I usually just get some nods, but if that's not the case, then we can have a conversation. We can think about pivoting mid quarter to make sure that we're still working on the right thing. So looking back to our, our second example um, of Cyberdyne systems with our two key results, you know, this is, if you're using OKRs, what you should be aspiring to. If you can show this slide at the start of your demo or your um, you know, sprint planning, it immediately gets everyone on the same page. Everyone knows where we are, where we're going, what we're doing. And having that starting point before you know, jumping into details can be a really powerful thing. Okay, so let's quickly <clears throat> think about how um, OKRs can help us in this example that I started off with. So here's the pretty picture for those of you who didn't get to see it the first time. Uh, we have all of these different requests. <clears throat> and the first thing that OKRs help us do is they let us assess the value of each of these requests. So maybe we come out with this. Let's say that, you know, uh, we've decided that these five things are not critical for uh, us meeting our objectives. And that also gives us a framework to go back to each of these stakeholders and say, Hey, look, you know, we've, we've looked at your, your request, we've assessed the value of it, and we just think that while it's a great idea, it doesn't help us meet our objectives uh, this time around, but, you know, we'll think about it for the future. And what it also does, it says, you know, um, it also gives you a way to uh, say yes to certain things. I mean, if compliance is telling you that you don't have license to operate if you don't do something, then, yeah, it's probably pretty important for your objective to include it. Maybe you look at what marketing has asked and say, hey, you know what, that, that actually is a really great idea. It actually helps us drive our objectives. Let's keep it in. And lastly, for continuous improvements, uh, something that I like to do is actually keep uh, one objective for just continuous improvements. Uh, that way the team has the ability to uh, improve how they work. And it also you know, lets us have that rigor around objectives and key results as we um, think about continuous improvement. All right, so before I, I sort of, I got about a minute left here. Um, you know, what I, what I want you to hopefully take away from this is that um, the goal of a good product manager is not to keep your team 100% utilized or, or busy all the time. It's really about finding the most valuable things to go after and focusing on just those. Um, you know, your team may not be as busy as they could be, but I think to be far more productive. Uh, with that, happy to open it up to, uh, to any questions. Awesome, thanks so much, Mark. Great presentation. Um, really quick, before I ask you my one favorite question, we like to ask all of our speakers. Um, I just downloaded your slides, so I'll be able to send them. I posted a comment in, the, um, in Facebook, so if anyone likes that comment, so I can go and find your name and then send them to you through Facebook. And um, also, guys, post any questions you have. I don't see any questions here yet for Mark, but our first question is, what advice would you give any aspiring product manager? 
It's a great question. Um, you know, I think probably the hardest thing about product management uh, is being a great storyteller. And you know, while while this is something tough to do, it's it's completely agnostic of your education, your industry, your experience. Um, and anyone can learn how to be a great storyteller and inspire others. So, you know, I think that that's something that's easily overcomable. Uh, so, you know, don't uh, don't get discouraged if you're trying to get into product management. If you can inspire other inspire others, I think you can be a great project manager. Awesome, that's really good advice. Um, cool. Let's see, we've got some comments coming in. I don't see any questions just yet. We'll give it a couple minutes. Maybe someone's typing out here. Oh, here we go. Um, I just transferred to PM by another function, engineer slash supply chain. Oh, where'd the question go? Come back here. I just transferred to PM by another function, engineer slash supply chain. What is your suggestion for someone transferring from a position like this? Any lessons learned? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I transferred from an engineer and, um, you know, what I find that, um, as someone comes into the project management space, they, they bring the skills that uh, they, they've learned in their past career. Mine being technical, I've had others, uh, other colleagues who are very much process oriented, um, some very much marketing focused. So my advice is that um, leverage the skills that you have already to excel. And then as time goes on, continue to you know, tackle the things that you aren't so good at it. Um, for instance, you know, I'm one of my weaker points might be, let's say marketing. So I would go off and learn about marketing to become a more holistic product manager. And, uh, you know, no one starts off knowing everything about product management. It just takes time and you learn these things and you do these things. Awesome. Thank you. Um, when in OKR framework, do we associate mes metrics to measure feature success? When in OKR framework, do we associate metrics to measure feature success? Okay. Um, hopefully, when you when you set out the feature that you are, you know, that you're trying to build, you set your metrics based on your key results. So you say, "Hey, I'm trying to achieve this, and this is how I'm going to measure it." Uh, the thing about OKRs is that, you know as you're building out your features or as you're implementing them and putting them into market, you want to continually be measuring and learning from them. Uh, you know, it's, as I said, if you are, you know, not only kind of looking at your metrics at the very end, but as you are progressing through the quarter, you're going to get a lot more value and be able to pivot more quickly uh, as you learn things from the market and from your customers. Okay, cool. Let's see. Mm. How do you advise in using OKR framework to align the team, tech, engineering, business, even more? Quarter quarterly roadmaps don't seem to be working out. Yeah, you know, I think roadmaps uh, are almost the complement to OKRs. Um, roadmaps kind of set out how uh, OKRs are really meant to set out uh, the why and to some extent the what. Um, and as I said, you know, when I said involve the team as you're building out your OKRs, I didn't necessarily mean just the tech team. I think I meant, like, I meant whoever are, you know, your key players within that team. And that could be marketing, tech, it could be process, it could be customer insights. Uh, if, if everyone is in that room and putting their spin and their lens on what you should be driving to achieve in that quarter, then you uh, almost organically get uh, buy-in and you almost uh, get to the point where everyone is aligned and focused on that proper uh, proper goal. Cool, cool. Okay, let's find another question here. Um, do you have any recommended templates to capture user stories? Do you have any recommended templates to capture user stories? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think the, the templates that I've been using have evolved over time, uh, depending on the team that I'm working with. Uh, in my experience, you know, it's really helpful for a new team to have a very defined uh, template within their stories. Um, and as your team matures, I feel like that sort of falls by the wayside because the team is mature enough to 
almost integrate their definition of done into how they think about stories. Uh, a couple things that I do do, um, especially with OKRs, I mean, um, it's a pretty easy cut and paste to say, this story drives you know, this objective, this key result, and it's part of this feature. And you know, well, it sounds like a lot of text. If you just cut and paste it, you, you immediately set the context for anybody who's reading that story. And then from there, you can sort of decide how detailed you want to be in terms of acceptance criteria and you know, risks, uh, dependencies, all those sorts of things that you list out in your story. But uh, my, I find that teams can you know, sort of evolve that template as time goes on and to meet their needs. Cool. And okay, let's see, I'll find one more question for you. Mm. Is there a difference between organizational slash team OKRs and then project slash program slash product OKRs? If so, how would you think about them? Yeah, well, I mean, organizational OKRs are meant to be, meant to be really high level things. Like, you know, we want to increase sales by 20%. And then depending on sort of the structure of your organization, you know, your product might just be one of many smaller products and you might say, well, I'm not going to drive a 20% growth in the overall company, but, you know, I have this interesting niche and I think there's an opportunity to maybe grow 1%. And then hopefully the other teams within your organization can kind of contribute the other 19%. That's what, sort of what I meant by feeding up into the, the organizational OKRs. Cool. Okay. Well, I think that um, that brings us to the end of our webinar here. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Really quick, I'm just going to give some background information on Product School, um, on our upcoming courses and events. And uh, just so you guys know, our product management, coding, data analytics, digital marketing, and blockchain courses are taught by industry experts working at companies like Google and Facebook. And in addition to that, we offer weekly online and on-site events at our 15 campuses across the U.S., U.K., and Canada. And uh, if you're located near a campus, make sure you stop by one of our weekly events every Wednesday and Thursday. And you can also find us on social media at Product School. And be sure to keep up with the latest product management content at the product blog, the product blog at productschool.com. So thank you all for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. And um, I hope to see you next week. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Have a good one.